Welcome back everyone to another little new episode of me playing Victoria 2! Yes, I am back people with another exciting let's play I'm going to be bringing you guys where I, Shredder James, will be playing not only a nation, but a mod. Yes, a mod people. Something that I delicately despise in most of my life and I usually don't like to do. I know that makes me a weird person, but I really just don't like mods. They just kind of give me a headache and installing and then trying to figure them all out to make sure they don't crash your computer. But the two mods I've ever made, it, uh, three mods I've ever made the exception for, and all of them involve Victoria 2. The first one you guys have already seen, and it is my zombie let's play of me playing in the United States. And if you haven't seen that, go see it right now. It is a great let's play, and it has one of the best endings I've ever had in a let's play in all in all my years like that is probably one of the best endings I've ever had so yeah go see that let's play right now it's really good um another mod though I also really like is the modern it's a modern nations mod or the modern day mod great mod to have great kind of great kind of look at the whole pseudo political aspect of today's world and how we all interact with each other through the lenses of Victoria 2 it's very interesting because you can actually see very many parallels between like the Victoria 2 era and today's era it's really really fun though it's really really fun I suggest you guys also get that if you're a Victoria 2 fan and then finally the third mod that I that I insanely love um is Victoria 2 popular demand mod one of the best mods I've ever seen for Victoria 2 probably the best I'm sorry Monday mod but Victoria 2 popular demand mod is probably the best mod I've ever had because of the fact that it completely not only does it just give new new skins and bases to all of the nations it actually gives its own new fresh air and completely modernizes the entire system of the entire game I mean there's not only just all these little changes to like the big changes to like the economy, how the map works, how do like infamy works, how well not really how infamy works, how it's like scaled and how can how you can like um have more events and stuff. There's some little tiny things that you would not notice unless you were actually a true Victoria 2 fan, which I'll try to point them out as we go along the game, but for me this kind of it this kind of becomes kind of natural for me and so I kind of forget to point them out to you guys, but because I played this so much that I love it, and I love it, and so I kind of forget about the regular version of Victoria 2. In fact, for like the first, I remember the first time when I came back to, this is just, I know this is completely random thought, but when I first came back to playing the original kind of game, it was back when like, my first day back was when I was playing, when I first played the uh, French campaign, my French campaign all the way back. That was like, I'd been playing the popular demand mod for so long that, when I came back to the French campaign, I was like, wait, what's this? What's this? Or was it, or was it my Canadian Let's Play? I don't remember. It was one of those early ones I did. And I just remember I came back and I was so weirded out because I don't, I didn't remember how to do everything. But anyways, I think this intro is becoming way too, it's, it's just becoming kind of candid and kind of bland and kind of boring. So I want to get into the game. Let's just get into the game. We're going to be playing as Austria, so... I'm going to cut away so you guys don't have to see a long loading screen. Even though I know it's not a long loading screen, I still like to cut away because it's still fun. So, see you guys in a second. Okay, guys, so, we're here in the game, and as you guys can see, this instantly looks different. <laughs> this does not look like a regular Victoria 2 game, and right off the bat, as you guys can tell, this is not the usual map of the world. I mean, look at the colors for once. I mean, look at those diverse colors. I mean, if they had done this in a regular game, this would have been so awesome, but... Oh, man, look at all this. So, yeah, this is popular demand mod. It is basically, as I put it, Victoria 2 2.0. Because it adds so many new stuff, and it's so much new stuff that it makes this almost an entirely new game. An entirely new feeling game. Much, actually, to be honest, it feels like a much more balanced version of Victoria 2, if I must be completely real. Like there are so many more options and so many and so much more stuff that it's impossible not to notice it. So let's go down the list of all the stuff that there's going to be in this game, and I'll get to the reason why we have this red outline here in a second. <laughs> it's a part of my new plan, guys. If you really must know. So let's go down production-wise. What has changed? Well, besides for the obvious fact that they basically reamped the entire like um, supply and demand system, where instead of like 
population is producing an insane amount for just one person. Now populations, I think, I think everything is cut down to like one tenth of the value it used to be. But you're producing like I think a tenth of more than it is. So there's an entire basically basically what I'm saying, guys. There's an entirely new system to this, and it's awesome. <laughs> it's an entirely new. It's entirely awesome, and it actually changes the game to a good. Like, not to a point where it's, like, breaking-wise, where you can't just adapt, but it changes it to a point where it's like, Oh, this is really nice. Why didn't they add this in the original game? Um, plus, not only plus with, um, new, like, reamped economics, they've also added their own specialties of, like, 14 new, 14 new resources. Um, I can't name them off a bat, but you guys can see here that this is, a, this is about 14 new resources up here. And about 20 new factories, some of which are really, really important, like the new system of early, middle, and late gun gun factories. Or some of them are just kind of cool to have, like cigar factories. So, yeah, this is entirely reworked, and it's insanely awesome. Like, just insanely awesome. So, that's the... With these two tabs, I don't think anything's really changed. It is about the same as usual, so that's not really changed. Budget-wise, um, this is probably the thing that hasn't changed the, the most. Like, this is about the same as it usually is. Um, the only thing I think it has changed, if I'm maybe correctly, is that Populous may revolt a little bit sooner. But don't quote me on that, because I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, this is the Populous screen, and while we're here, we might as well just see if I want my economics to be like this. Um, try giving the rich a little bit more of an advantage. I need them to build factories in the beginning, so... Yeah, let's let's do that. <laughs> I, we sound like I'm a sleazy dealer right now. The the rich, we, we have to tax the rich because we because we want to get them to build my stuff for me. Okay, but anyways, moving on from there, we have the uh, technology tree, and this has been completely reworked. Like, if you guys have noticed, there are completely new technologies, and there's completely lots of new options. Um, well, that's not a good example. Um, this is the this is a good example right here. Positivism, if you guys remember, would only give like 20% efficiency. Now it gives like 20% efficiency plus all these other bonuses plus colonial points. Alright. So in this entire system, they basically reworked it to the point where there wouldn't be like one super technology that you need to get always so you would always win the game. Like in regular Victoria 2, for example, you always need to get in nationalism and imperialism if you're trying to go for a colonial power. Or if you're a um, regular industrial power, you always have to get you always have to get these three technologies to survive. Um, what they basically did was they basically like leveled out the entire technologies and did not super duper one technology. I mean, you can still go for the regular ones, but it's a good, definitely a good idea to try to invest in everything because if you forget anything in this game, like seriously, I forgot, I forgot like just doing my market structure. Which it gives me a 10% efficiency rate. Uh, it will screw you over. Let's just say that. It will screw you over. Because then, like, your your literacy doesn't grow as much. And then that doesn't make your tech grow as much. Which then you fall behind really quickly. And it just becomes this big, gigantic mess. So that is not good. We don't want that to happen. And that's where, where like, all this kind of good balancing goes in. Which I personally like. I like this new technology system. Alright. The next part is the politics. Oh my goodness, today we worked a policy screen. This is an awesome policy screen, guys. Like, let's just start from over here. Over here is usually is usually the part of the game where no one pays attention to. I mean, we pay attention to the upper house because we like to see it, but this is something that they've changed completely, which is this current icon called Order. Now, in regular Victoria 2, you had three different types of government policies, which was like liberty, order, and something else. And that was it! That's all you got throughout the entire game. You could not switch it, you could not do anything. You would always be those three, three um, you know, government, government types, well not government types, national values for the entire game. And you know, coming from like a historical standpoint, that is completely incorrect. You know, people change. <laughs> I guess is the simple way of saying it. People change, and to have this not change with the times and with the current like people's way of thinking, especially when you try to be a national populi, it doesn't make any sense. So what they've done is they've added like 15 new national values to this game, which completely like makes it all these kind of cool, diverse things, and they all have their own special 
little prefers and little stuff to do like for example order is more associated with um um industry and colonialism to the max so if i want to go colonial values this is the one i want to go into in addition to that it is also more strongly supportive of like conservative socialist and a little bit of fascist parties so not only does this actually help you with some of your laying down of upper house but it also helps you with your other colonial stuff and also has these other bonuses right here which are also pretty cool okay and then now we go over here to the political and social reforms oh my goodness today we work all this like a lot of this has a really good a lot of this has a really good stuff I mean there are some standard things like p pensions and mil minimum wage not minimum not minimum minimum wage but at the same time they've done this they've also done a popular they also done add these cool things like pop pollution like this is this is something I never thought of but why would we not have a pollution like social reform in there because pollution is actually a pretty like big part about factories and everything like that so they really should be like I don't know all I'm saying guys is here is that there's a lot of cool new stuff that they added that really does make the game feel more alive especially when you have minorities like this this gets into a moral point do we protect our minorities or do we not protect our minorities and the short answer is I will not tell you yet <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, we move on from there, and we do the movements and the rebel screen has been completely reworked. Okay, rebels are much more common, like a lot more common. In fact, there were about three periods of insane rebels, insane rebel like deployment. There's the liberal agitation movement, which is going to be basically ultra liberals and radical liberals, and basically liberals of all sorts rising up in your country and trying to take you over. And it becomes an ins and if you're like an absolute monarchy like me, it's going to be insanely hard to keep my empire together. Um, there's also going to be the second wave, which is going to be the communist revolution. I think we all know what the communist one is. It's basically the end all be all stuff of legend, where the communists rise up and try to reform, try to get my empire to become their socialist and utopian ideals. Uh, yeah, it's also going to be a hard one to break. And then we have the third one, which is going to be the fascists rising up, which I don't want to talk about them because they're usually the ones I usually like to. Yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be the rebel system in this game. Um, also, because since I'm going to be playing as Austria-Hungary, I'm also going to have frequent national nationalism movements and patriotic movements of my little different minorities. So we're gonna we're gonna have to do something about that because we definitely don't want them to rebel against us because I don't think I could deal with an entire like gigantic war of epic proportion of like every single little like the Czechoslovakians, the Hungarians, and the like Bosnians all revolting against me at the same time. That would just be beyond 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 capable of my capacity to deal with. So yeah. Rebel system completely reworked. Also, yeah. Now, the decisions-wise, they have done an insanely good job about decisions. Like, I always felt in the original game that there weren't really much decisions to do. Like, the basic decisions that you had were just not customizable enough for any nation you need to play as. Like, if I played as, like, England, there was a definite decisions of, there's a definite, like, difference between the decisions I can make as England and the decisions I can make as like Austria or Russia or like Ottomans, you know, it's just, it feels like they, it feels like Victoria 2 didn't give much love to, to the nations besides just Germany, the USA and England, it just didn't, and France I guess, didn't really feel like they gave much love, but in this mod, oh my goodness did they add so much, like look at all this, look how many decisions I can do, oh my goodness, it feels so nice to have all these decisions available to me and just being like um feeling like all these decisions are just like cool i mean look at this create romania you could never do this in the original game you would always have to like you know first first free romania from all this you know bs and then you'd have to do a lot of like cool sphering and you'd have to do a lot of this and that all you have to do all you have to do in this game to, to make romania you just have to like conquer like Make the Ottomans, and then just sphere these guys. Well, actually, sphere all three of these guys, and then you can make Romania. It's that simple. You don't have to just make an entirely country of Romania. 
and then just hope that they eventually expand into the, into their borders. You can just make Romania. And I like that. I like that a lot about this. And plus, not only that, but there are different, like, tons of, like, um, certain events, like, like in terms of uh, historical events, like, there's the Congress of Berlin, which basically means we're going to divide up the world. Uh, and there's a lot of events for, like, China, where China basically gets screwed over in this game. The Qing Empire, I should say. It basically has, like, two major revolts it can get to. And if they survive that, they usually become a pretty strong nation, but if they don't, uh, extraterritorial ter torality usually takes over. So, that's going to be fun to talk about when we get to that point. Um, next thing up is going to be doing is population. Uh, yeah, basically everything's been cut. Everything's been worth one, one tenth of its value, so, yeah. And if you want to see the religions I have in my country, I have some Jewish people in my country. Huh. The one size 175 Jewish people in my in my army right now. That is amazing. How many is that like the only let's see, most of my country seems to be No, I actually have a decent Jewish population. Wow! That's pretty sweet! Okay, well psh, I just learned some things. But yeah. Basically what I'm telling you guys about this is that the population and trade trade hasn't really changed that much. It's basically the same for Victoria too, so don't really mind these. Diplomacy wise, okay. This actually does need to be talked about just a little bit. I mean, there isn't really much that really has changed in, core, in terms of the basic cores. Like, you get a nation, you try to improve the prestige, or you try to disprove, uh, try to disprove relations, or then you just justify wars against them. I mean, you, or if you really want to be in your sphere of influence, and you just add this right here, and you know, you just keep adding it, and the more you want, the more you add in more priorities. If you don't want, you just don't click it, and you just use it to like fight other people. Yeah, that, that doesn't really change. What has changed is the fact that, that they've completely reamped the infamy system to where everything is not exactly the same as it was in Victoria 2. Like, demand concessions was only 5.0 infamy, now it's 7.5 infamy. So there's little changes like that in the entire, in the entire game, and um, for the most part, this isn't, it doesn't really change that much until you get to the later period and the Great War status. Now, there's an, now, if you guys don't know this, there's an entirely sub-mod in, in the popular demand mod called Great Wards Mod. The Great Wards Mod basically makes it so that um, gigantic nations will fight other gigantic nations, and when the gigantic nations of one side wins, they basically dismantle the empire of the other gigantic nations. So what does that mean? Well, for instance, if I was playing as Prussia, and I went to war against France, and Russia joined my side, and Austria joined the French side, and we won, well, in the options menu, we'd basically have the options to dismantle the empire. And what that would do is that would basically split France into half and create, like, Occitania, uh, Brittany, Normandy, and divide up all the colonial conquests amongst me and Russia. It would also destroy the entire Austrian lands, where they would just break up into all these little tiny little nations like Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, the Great Wars, and plus, while you're also doing that infamy, like, to demand a concession, which would normally be about 13.0 infamy, only becomes like 0 0.5 infamy. So, it's a pretty big deal in this game to have, like, Great Wars and all, and all that, but at the same time, the cooldown is about three years, even if you win the war, and five years if you lose the war. So, you can't just go around and just use it all the time, and then, you know, hopefully do it in, like, a world conquest. It's just not going to happen, guys. I know a lot of you guys are thinking, like, oh, that had been such a good idea, but it's just not going to happen. Okay? And then we have the military. Um, in terms of what they've added, in terms of what they added, what is new and what is not going to be new, basically... There are a different assortments of units, like there's the mobile cavalry and there's the artillery. And you could basically sum it up into mobile artillery, um, infantry, and irregulars are basically the people that you use to... They're, they're basically your mobile militia. They're not really trained recruits, they're just people who pick up a gun and go fight. <laughs> you know, all like, all like, yeah, I have a gun, I'm gonna go shoot people. That's how we do patriotism in our house. Damn. So, that's basically what they are. Um, in this game, you want to keep... The new basic order of how to keep a good, like, structured unit is... 
I think it's about 10 infantry units, one, yeah, you only want one, um, one, one guard, and two infantry, about five of these guys, and about two of these guys. That's basically how you comprise, well, actually, wait, eight of these guys. If we're doing 10 base system, yeah, eight of these guys. Yeah, that's how you basically make a good unit in this game. But the problem with that is, is that these guys are insanely expensive and cost-consuming to make. So if you just need a quick army, make these guys. If you need, like, good properly trained troops, make these guys. If you're trying to make all of these guys, because these guys will help you out in almost any war. Um, and in terms of other, other like, little things that they've changed, um... Migrations have been reworked to a little bit differently. Um, basically, people will not just migrate to a certain country because of like um, they just have the national ideas of democracy. Yeah. Um, now people will basically move to different countries if they have job openings and if they are accepting towards immigration and stuff like that. So it's an, it's a little change that you know can potentially be a big change because. Um, it, it always is kind of weird where you have like an entire factory that's not open and then you have a province that like has a hundred K craftsmen and you're like Guys, you know, there is a factory right open. I, I can't fathom why you guys are not going there yet So I Believe that's it Wow That was a lot to talk about Um, oh wow, we don't have much time either. Wow well, this episode's probably going to be a little bit too long for us to start today, so what I'm going to make this is like make this episode zero so you guys just get a basic overall feel. And next episode, we will finally start the campaign and get into my plans about everything. All right, I'll s and I want to thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Okay, guys, welcome back to another episode of Victoria 2, Popular Demand Mod Austria. -ha -ha -ha. Actually... Yeah, I'm not gonna make this. I'm not. Nah, they, they don't deserve a wahaha. They need like some. I need something else. Hmm. I need to think about this because I need to make the intro to this Austrian, Austrian campaign really, really special. Um. Yeah, I'll I'll develop it later. But yeah, the wahaha I don't think is gonna be it. Anyways, guys. Um. Welcome back to the Victoria 2 popular man mod as I just said. And here we're actually gonna start the game. And and as I said before. If you guys want an entire talk about what is different about the game and what is kind of like um cool and unique about the game, just go to this previous episode before this. It's called episode 00 because for this episode, we're actually just going to talk about my strategy for how I'm going to win the game. But if you guys are going to be lost about things and going to be lost about like what's going to happen, or like you're wondering why is this different or anything like that just go to the previous episode I think it explains it enough to the point where you guys can basically understand it uh, but for this episode we're just basically going to like talk about my strategy and a lot of you guys might be wondering James why do you have a big out red outline <sighs> why do you have a big red outline well this is just basically my new empire what what are you talking about? Well, glad you asked, people. Because basically what I'm talking about is that I want to make an entirely new Austrian empire. Because as I know from history, Austria is not exactly the most luckiest nation when it comes to keeping borders up. And due to some stupidity with a great war and stuff, they basically lost all of their land and stuff. And I don't like that. I don't like that future that is envisioned by what the world of ours has has sought out. I don't like the idea that my empire is going to eventually be broken up by all the other Europeans in the world and I'm basically going to be like this little nation right here. This nation right here. Yeah, no. <laughs> I like all my land, so I basically envisioned a plan. A plan that will take us to the heavens and to the earth and to make us the Austrian nation of the world. So, what does this plan entail? It entails the plans of Austria will be strong plan. Where basically, 
I've divided it into about one, two, three, four, five plans. Five sub plans in this gigantic idea of my first plan. Where it's all its goal is, is to make Austria strong. Okay? That's all the goal is, is to make Austria strong. To make it the most powerful nation in the world. To beat out those Prussians. To beat out those Russians. To destroy the French. That is what this Austrian will be strong category is. And we will not succumb to what history has entailed to us as being that nation that has collapsed and been fringed upon and, in my mind, laughed upon by the other nations. We will remain strong and we will teach those other nations what it is to be an Austrian. Yeah! Alright. So basically, in this overall company plan, there's a base form in this. This is going to be the general form I'm going to take in almost any of the other plans because I know for each plan I will not be able to accomplish everything in it okay in each plan there's gonna be like stuff I'll need to do and stuff I'll need to try and some of them plans overlap but generally I'll not be able to accomplish it all so this is just basically I guess options you could say about what I should do about where I should go and what I should do but this is just kinda of the base form this is the stuff I'm definitely gonna do and this is it. In my category, I'm going to definitely conquer all the Bosnian region and all the Serbian region. Um, because basically, I don't want major rebellions with the Serbians using the crisis mode against me. Okay, because the crisis mode is very deadly. Especially when, especially when you have as many enemies as I will. Because right now, as you got Austria, right now as you guys know, Prussia... If you guys haven't played this before, starting Austria and Prussia usually start with a good good friendship, but usually become really big enemies because Prussia wants to unite Germany and Germany becomes like a major issue. So they're going to I'm basically saying that everyone eventually is going to become like my enemy. So yeah, we definitely don't want Serbia to enact like a crisis mode where it's gonna shut me off. Um also over here, I've I've basically decided that I'm not going to try to um, form the Germanic Empire. And people are like, what? But the Germanic Empire is so big and it gives you so much like industrial power, military strength, and, and, and prestige, and yada yada yada. Yeah, I don't really care about that. I don't really care about the whole Germanic stuff. Because in my opinion, we're not Germanic. We're Austrians. And as Austrians, we will act as such. So, what that means is that I'm not going to try to form the empire. I'm not going to try to form the empire of the South Germanic Federation or the Germanic Empire because I just don't think we are those things. Plus, if I were to form those empires, what that basically means is I would have to turn off. Um, to form the South Germanic Federation, that basically means I have to give away all my non Germanic lands. So, what are my non Germanic lands? That's basically all of this. Okay? I would only be able to keep my Austrian lands and my Czechoslovakian lands and then I'd have to own all this land over here yeah so and then I'd be able to form the South Germanic Federation so is that worth it uh, let's see have this land or have this land I think it's a pretty clear choice of which one I'm gonna choose so yeah that's the reason why I'm not gonna go after the South Germanic the South German Federation, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is generally what I want to do with my conquest spree. Um, that means I'm probably going to eat in some of my vassals, but I'm pretty sure... Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to... They're not going to maintain my vassals forever. I mean, yeah. Let's move on from there, though, because I think I'm starting to actually lose my voice. Um, actually, give me one second. I'll be right back, people. Okay, guys, yeah, I was kind of losing my voice there for a, little, for a second there, so, yeah, I had to go get some water, had to go get something to drink, kind of just kind of take a break to breathe in my own inner breath, peace, I don't know, meditate, whatever, uh, uh, terms, 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 okay, yeah, but let's just go, let's just go through the list really quickly, so, what is my SOI plan, and for SOI, for those of you people who are not sure what SOI means, that means Sphere of Influence Plan. So my Sphere of Influence Plan is going to be this. Boom. Um, basically what this entails is that I want to have this, the Iberian Peninsula underneath my boot. 
um, the Netherlands region underneath my boot. I want these regions underneath my boot, and I want this little region of Romania underneath my boot. Plus also Bulgaria. Oh, excuse me, people. Plus also Bulgaria and all of South America. Okay. Um, for each, they kind of have their own special purpose, and for these four, they actually serve a different plan, which I'll get to in a second, but for these two, I just want them in my sphere of influence because um, Spain is usually a good province to have, not because they usually do a really good job of industrializing, they usually suck at it, but they usually are a good nation to have for like military, and especially if you want to go beat up on France, you need them. Because they're really good at like diverging French soldiers so that they just go in and go kill all your Spanish while you secretly go invade France over here and stab them in the back. So, they're really good as a meat shield, okay? Really, really good as a meat shield and sometimes when they actually are really good, they'll sometimes become a really good great power when it comes to military. So, always good to have them in your sphere. Portugal, it's just good to have them in your sphere for whatever reasons. Uh, Netherlands, it's good to have them in your sphere because they have lots of good land over here. So, really good idea to keep them in your sphere. They also produce usually a decent amount of industry, which can be good or bad depending, because sometimes they actually become a great power, and that usually annoys you, because you're like, I invested all this time and effort and fought you off with other, like, 16 other great powers, and you just turn on me. Thanks! Alright, so, yeah. And in South America, usually people... People are like thinking, wait, why would you go out to South America? You're Austria. You have absolutely no reason to go over here. And plus, America's uh, doctrine, the Moreau doctrine, says that there are supposed to be no Europeans mess messing around in, in uh, South America. Well, first off, I don't care what America thinks because America, America in this game is not me. So, yeah. Go do whatever you want, America. I can still go destroy you. Okay? At least right now I can't. In later games, probably not. But right now, I can still destroy you, so don't you dare go mess with me. Um, secondly, South America is just a great continent to conquer. I mean, it has almost all the resources you ever... It has a lot of resources that you're gonna need for later games. Well, at least... Well, not resources you're gonna need for later games, but resources that will not be found in any other place but South America. Um, for instance, the coffee... Oh, wait, I still got the maps open. Let's just get to RG output... All G outputs right there. There we go. Coffee. Coffee is a major distributor of mostly South of South America. I mean, there are some other places in the world, like over here and over there, and a little bit over here and over there. But really, the main person to produce coffee is South America. Okay. And that's a really good luxury good that you can easily use to help keep your people from rebelling and trying to do a massive, like, 100k stacks onto you. So, yeah, um, it's just a general good idea to just conquer South America. Plus, no other European ever goes after any of South America except America. So, it's always a good idea to go after South America. Because, most likely, you'll have Brazil in your sphere of influence for, like, ever. I mean, literally, they never... I've had a game where I kept them from 1939 all the way to 1936. And not one other European power tried to take them from me. So... Yeah, it's just generally a good idea to do this. Um, other stuff. So yeah, that's my spearing clan. And you, uh, observant you of uh, viewers, eh, viewers will probably notice that I did not include any of of uh, Italy in this. And people will be asked, why did I do that? It was actually a very simple reason, and that comes down to the fact that Italy is an insanely is like it's just a pain. Let's put it like that. It's a pain to try to keep all these little spheres of influence together, alright? It's a pain to keep it together and to try to make sure, like, the two Sicilies and, like, Sardinia Pinmont don't try to take them from you. But then it gets almost... The game basically cheats at that at, like, later dates in the game where it basically, like, automatically has, like, 100k... I might be joking here. 100k rebels spawn on each individual little country to then make the Italian country so basically even if you do keep these guys together or if you do keep all your spheres together they're basically gonna revolt against you and still form Italy no matter how hard you try so yeah and I'm just putting this down here I'm not gonna go in and go squash like a hundred K rebels with my army right now I could 
I could probably do it about that point in the game, but yeah, I'm not spending that much time and effort in Italy. It's just not worth it. If they want to be united, how? Why should I stop them? So, yeah, that's the main reason why I'm not going to care about whatever goes on in Italy, because in my view, it's basically pointless. It, they, they're going to unite and become the Empire anyways. The, the only thing I should worry about, though, is I keep good defenses on the lines, because Sardinia is going to always want to attack me. They are just war hawkish like that, so, yeah, going to keep a close eye on them. All right, that's my first, and that's my first plan with SOI. Um, this is probably going to be the biggest plan, because it's going to probably take the most amount of explaining. The rest of them usually go much quicker, so let's get on to it. My Asian plan! Or what should I want from Asia? And this is what I want from Asia! <laughs> yes, look at the vast glory of it! Um, yeah, just to be basically for Asia, um, I want to conquer John, uh, Johor, I want to conquer this little part of Indonesia, I want to conquer Da Nang. And for China, well, this gets a little bit hairy here, because I want to conquer a lot of China, but I really don't know how much I can actually take for them. And the reason why is because since China is going to have two major rebellion, rebellions, the Taiping Rebellion and the um, the Warlord Wars, um, I really don't know how fractured these guys are going to be and how easy it is to like take territories. I mean, I've had games where like they fracture to the point of like each like this nation I could take. There's a nation right here, there's a nation right here, there's a nation right here. Like, basically all of the Qing Empire is fractured to a point where it's so easy to pick off and, and get all this good luscious land and get all that good population boost. But in other games, they've been able to actually, well, them not themselves, but like the nationalist, the nationalist China are able to like keep themselves together and keep a general overall look. So then I don't actually be able to take much from them. Just being able to take like the island. So, it really does depend on how the game plays out, but for that, yeah, this is basically what I want from Asia, and hopefully I'll get it. Colonizational-wise, um, yeah, I'm not going as big as I did with my French campaign, I'm going a little bit smaller, like, um, yeah, I just want this much land, you know, a decent amount of land from all this and not really anything from over here and whoa oh, sorry sorry people I forgot about these nations right here I forgot they were new but yeah yeah I'm just gonna take a little bit of land from over here you know just general stuff I it's not really too important to me to get too much of the colonialism down because I'm Austria and that's not really where I want to focus on my efforts but if I do go for a colonial empire this is probably what I'm gonna be generally trying to do Alright, I'm also going to be trying to do some colonializing over here because I want to make sure I get those luscious oil fields, man. Those luscious oil fields because they are going to help my empire prepare it to the, pre propel it to the biggest it'll ever be. Alright, um, and of course I'm also going to take over the Suez Canal. Yeah, just standard stuff right there. Alright, next plan is the New Europa Plan. And this one gets a little bit more fun because this basically makes me... It basically makes me want to say is that I want to dismantle the entire European structure. Like Russia, I want to completely dismantle their eastern or west... Eastern? West? It's eastern, yeah, it's eastern because... Because this side is the eastern and this side is the western if you're looking at it from the map. Oh, I, yeah, I want to completely make two buffer states between me and Russia. Because Russia is usually a very annoying country to deal with. No matter what time period you deal with. They just usually don't like Austria no matter what they do. And they're usually not your buddies, so, yeah, let's just try, I want to try to dismantle the empire to where I have two buffer states of Poland and Ukraine blocking them up and so that they'll be the ones getting conquered instead of my own land being conquered, because I want to make sure I have good buffer states. And why would, and a lot of people think, but why would you form Poland? They also, not only do they have cores on Russia, but they also have cores on you. Well, if you make sure that Poland's in your sphere of influence and you make sure Ukraine's in your sphere of influence, mainly Poland, I mean, they won't try to use the crisis mode against you. So you could basically use that as an excuse to also go and go conquer other nations and go liberate their lands for your own selfish benefits. So yeah, Prussia, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm going to try to free Poland and give them all this land. Um, yeah, I don't know how successful I'm going to be on that, but this is what I'm going to try to shoot for. Um, in terms of the Ottomans, though, I'm basically thinking about dismantling the entire Ottomans, and the Ottomans are basically going to be becoming my Tinker toy. 
Like, almost all my strategies, I realize, involve the Ottomans dying in some way or some form. Like, I'm gonna need the Ottomans to collapse over here so I can conquer, like, this little part of the Ottoman Empire right here so that they don't have, like, Egypt and the Ottomans joining at the same time. Or I'm gonna need them to collapse over here because I don't want them to deal, I don't want them to interfere with our nation over here, so... Yeah, the Ottomans almost in any scenario, in almost any plan, this is like the big overlap, is that they're going to be torn apart. I'm basically going to tell them apart, make Bulgaria, Romania, Iraq, Damascus, and maybe Palestine and Jordan if I really want to. But, most likely not. After that point though, the Empire should be fragmented enough to a point where it will not come back. And maybe we'll just have some fun like sphering it or coring it, I don't know. It's just a plan. And then for my industrial plan, people... <laughs> yeah, there wasn't really much I can really explain about this, except I'm just going to try to become an industrial base and try to keep up with everyone else. Um, the only thing is, is that it does become really hard later in the game to try to keep up with a fully empowered America, America, and a fully empowered Germany, if Germany were to form there. Now... I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold myself to a grand delight of grandeur where I'm gonna say that I'm not gonna prevent I'm gonna prevent Germany from actually forming because that's almost not impossible because the because the Prussians usually do a good job of of doing everything right essentially. So But I'll try my best and we'll see what happens. So yeah, I think I've finally talked about everything. Um Oh man, there's only a minute left. Oh man. Well, guys, it seems like this is going to be like episode zero, zero affinity, I guess. I've, I've never had two episodes where I've, where I've had to like explain two different types. Um, but since we did explain it, I might as well start balancing out my, uh, economy now just so that we can start like, okay, I need just about 75, 75, all right, yeah, let's just start balancing out everything and start showing you all the decisions I'm going to be making, the right to man. Um, decisions, um, in terms of decisions guys, I'm just going to be moving towards trying to form the Duberian Empire, which means I'm either going to, I'm going to have to form Austria-Hungary, and then from there I'm going to have to do a lot of other stuff. Um, diplomacy-wise, okay, I'm going to try to become friends with France, at least for now, because France would be a really good ally to have. And then in terms of my military, eh, we probably should support that. And with that, guys, I want to thank you guys for watching. This is another Zero Zero episode. I promise next episode we'll actually get the gameplay, okay? Alright, I'll see you guys next time.